Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Money Matters, because after all, money matters. Have I got a treat for you this week? This is something a little bit different. What we've got here is two of our masterminders, or rather ex-masterminders, but you never really leave the mastermind. And I started working with Andrew and Peter way back in 2015. Now, Andrew has gone on and been so successful in what he's doing with commercial property that he's actually gone on to become one of our mentors. So real insight from a real property investor that, and Andrew was actually on my very first ever mastermind all those years ago. He's gonna physically walk you through the project and, and Peter as well. They're gonna share with you very openly some issues they uncovered, some 50,000 pound things they had to deal with and uh, having to replace their main contractors and all sorts of other things. So this is a real warts and all behind the scenes look into the world of commercial property investment. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce you to them. So here we go. This is Andrew Bartlett and Peter Abel. I'll catch you at the end. So welcome, I'm Andrew Bartlett and welcome to the Engine Shed in Whitby. Before we actually sit down and talk about commercial property, let's go on a little tour. Welcome to the Engine Shed. I'm Andrew Bartlett and this is my business partner, Peter Abel. And together we've transformed a mid-Victorian engine shed into 11 apartments that are being used for service accommodation, principally holiday accommodation. And this is where the guests first arrive. They've come through the door and they arrive and collect their keys from the key safe. They're all obviously given the code prior to arriving and then they go and find their accommodation. So let's take a wander. Here we've got the beams. These beams were sandblasted. It took two weeks or so to sandblast them. Uh, they were actually black, full of soot before we started. Uh, but now quite a rich brownie colour and the lights, the lights were actually in the building itself so we were able to repurpose the lights and we really wanted to do that because it adds a little bit more character. So you'll notice that all of our apartments are named after steam locomotives. That is all except one and that's named after the carriages. Why have we named it after the carriages? Well when this was first in operation it was drawn by horses. Those carriages were drawn by horses. And those first three carriages were Premier, Transit and Lady Hilda. Now we're not going to visit that one today. We're going to visit Repton. And Repton is actually a train that runs on the line during the summer here in Whitby. So let's go and have a look. So in we come. And this is a one bedroom apartment. And we're going to pan into the bedroom first, just take a quick look in the, in the bedroom. So all of our beds, or pro predominantly all of our beds in the engine shed are super kings. So they're two full size single beds put together, luxury single beds, got the fire category, really important that they've got the, the fire rating that's really required for this type of accommodation when you've got multiple units. Interestingly, we were looking to fuse the modern with the history. So we weren't able to touch these stone walls. So we've put glass all across so that you can still see the stone walls. And we put glass with French, French doors opening onto the railway track. So we weren't able to actually touch the, the wall. So we were able to retain all the history uh, of the listed building, but then put the modern touches with the glass all along it. So lots of modern touches in with the history of the beams as we go along. So what else have we got? Quartz worktops, glass splashbacks. So once again, trying to fuse the modern with the old, I suppose, features and the big beams here at the top of the engine shed. But shall we, for the time being, go next to Evening Star? World War II, the engine shed got bombed. And if like from about here, where we're standing, through here, as we walk along here, going backwards from where we've just come from, the engine shed was still intact. 
But unfortunately, this section was bombed during the war. As a temporary measure, they just bricked it up. But that temporary measure lasted for the best part of, I'm just trying to work it out on my fingers, probably about 80 years uh, until we came along and then extended it back to its original position. Now in uh, this part of the engine shed, we had to recreate all of the features of the existing shed. So for example, there are grills on the outside of each of the window openings, although those windows aren't what you'd look for in a residential property. But for example, in here, you can just see through the window that we've got a grill on there and there are four grills and those four grills cost 33,000 pounds. Once again, in here, you'll see the modern touches, the glass splash bats, the quartz worktops, uh, decent Wren kitchens, so that it's once again giving the, the guests an experience, not just uh, a visit to Whitby. Then we've got a smaller double, double room in this one and then a larger uh, double room with its own toilet and whatever in there. So once again, this uh, very much looks out to the station because you can imagine the engine sheds were next to the station and so just there if you walked up a little slope you'd be on the platform now unfortunately we have not got direct access i think it's fortunately and unfortunately the unfortunate thing is our guests can't walk straight in the fortunate thing is that we don't get every tom dick and harry coming off the trains wanting to get in the engine shed so it works both ways but the great thing is especially when the steam trains come in we do get a lot of people that are perhaps of my age or older that hark back to the, the days of steam and so they do like staying in, in the, the apartments uh, just to get that experience of the steam engines. So let's carry on and we're going to now go to the Flying Scotsman. So this is one of our bigger apartments and in this bigger apartment we've got obviously greater room in the, the kitchen and greater room in the living room area and you can see as we sweep round we've got two big leather sofas once again, we've got the, the glass splashbacks uh, and the uh, quartz worktops, but in the, quite a few of these, we've got either a big breakfast bar like this or a quartz worktop with a smaller, slightly smaller uh, breakfast bar. Uh, the key things here I would probably like to know are the beams, because we've got uh, some decent beams. If there was a fire, we needed a smoke shaft to get the smoke from the ground floor. We didn't want people being trapped on the ground floor and choked by the smoke. So we needed to put in a, a smoke shaft that would uh, pull up the, the smoke in, a, in case of fire. We were told that potentially it needed an automated version that would cost £50,000 and that £50,000 was not in our budget. Now this is where I'm going to hand over to my colleague Peter. There is a grill downstairs uh, which comes up through into this area. So behind this, this wall is a, is a hidden, if you like, shaft and the plan was to bring a huge pipe at the ceiling height level through this wall if you look at the beams through the rectangular beams there it would then change shape into a triangle to get through these other beams and then out through this wall here and through the roof because we don't like spending money that we don't need to and we hadn't budgeted to spend an extra fifty thousand pounds we tried to think of ways in which we could mitigate that we remembered earlier on in the design process that they suggested that a natural shaft, just drawing up without automated uh, help, uh, needed to be a metre by about 70 centimetres. And keeping that in mind, we thought, is there a different way in which we could do, do that? So what we did, we actually moved the wall of the kitchen. The wall of the kitchen had already been put in but we had the idea to pull forward the kitchen by just over 70 centimetres to create the 70 centimetres width, spent probably two to 3,000 pounds pulling that and making that change, but it saved us almost 50,000 pounds. So basically we created a, a, a false wall, if you like, or a false chamber behind the kitchen wall, which allowed the smoke, if there was a fire, to be drawn through that area. So that's a short tour of just three apartments in the engine shed. I hope you found it uh, beneficial to see what we've been able to do, turning pretty much w something that was a redundant old engine shed uh, that was just a stone carcass with a, a concrete floor in the middle of it into some beautiful apartments here in Whitby. So we've had a look around the engine shed. I thought I'd just take a little bit of time to give you some numbers uh, so you can equate those numbers and what you've seen and think whether this is the sort of thing for you. We started the 
purchasing process of the, the, the engine shed back in 2017 and eventually it was bought in May 2018. The actual cost of the purchase plus purchase cost was approximately £450,000. Then the build, so where we're sitting in this new build area plus the conversion which as I said earlier on was almost a new build, uh, cost £1.4 million. So all told about £1.8 eight five million pounds the value today is around the three million pounds mark so the key for us is all about adding value and when i look at something it's how can we best add value to the thing that we're buying so that gives you an idea of the the, the numbers and how we've added value to this particular building but what does it mean as far as maintaining and keeping this uh this building so for us it's all about does it generate enough profit does it generate enough income if we take 2019 so in 2019 we opened the engine shed two guests uh, about the second week of august and we opened it in two phases the first three apartments and then then the rest and in that time we generated just over 158,000 pounds worth of bookings and visits to the engine shed during that time if we look at 2019 and uh, then go to 2020 in the six months that we were able to open in 2020 and normally we would be open all year round but because we were hit by covid and forced to shut we are only open for six months and in that time we generated over 194,000 pounds worth of income if you look at that five months and the six months so just less than 12 months we generated over 350,000 pounds of bookings and stays during that time in the first 12 months of people being able to visit the engine shed which is pretty phenomenal in 2021 although we haven't been open all year so we're likely to be open for about uh, seven months or so in uh, 2021 the bookings are really strong again so we've got about seven and a half months worth of bookings that we can take assuming that we don't get hit by anything else having to close down service accommodation so what does that mean at the moment well we've had over 154,000 pounds worth of bookings already for 2021 so obviously the we've got some that are just about to come in in a short while and going through the rest of 2021 we've even got almost ten thousand pounds for 2022 so i'm sat here uh, at this point in time uh in april 2021 so we've got people booking almost a year in advance for their stays in the engine shed and people ask me why do i decide whether i keep something or sell something and to me it's all very simple it's all about the numbers and what i can do with the money and what return i can get with the money with the cash that i've got if i can get more from selling the the property now and reinvest it in another project then i will potentially sell it so People ask, is the engine shed for sale? Well, anything's for sale at a price. So for me, if we could be able to find another project and that would allow us to, to finance another project where we could potentially double our money again, then that's what we would do. I think it all, it, it's my usual phrase, it depends. It depends on the returns we can get on our money. If at another time somebody came to us and said, what about the engine shed, would you sell it? The answer is always, everything's for sale at a price. If we can get more and do more from the, with that money at a particular time. I actually got started in commercial property investing when I was looking for my first commercial conversion property. That was Northgate Court in Gloucester with my long-term business partner. And we were looking for something that we could convert from commercial to residential. With that strategy, we were very much looking to add value. So that first commercial conversion, that first commercial property was in 2000 and 16 when we purchased it uh, and completed the conversion in 2017. I'm always looking as to where I can add value. With this particular property, we were able to convert it and take something that was costing probably around 60 or 70 pounds uh, a square foot to somewhere around the 250 pounds per square foot. Uh, and obviously we've got costs in between. So for us, it was very much a case of adding value and when you're looking to add value you can add that in many ways it's not just the pure commercial conversion just from the commercial to the residential but it's also uh, the slight changes that you can make to the layout for example that had a lift so we were able to take out the lift 
And by taking out the lift, we actually reduced the service charges for the residential that were left. But more importantly, we were able to use the lift shaft for bathrooms and put all our services through the lift shaft, which meant that it was easy to put those services in. They were all stacked. And because we didn't need to use the lift, we didn't need the space for people to wait in front of the lift. So we were able to put kitchens in those spaces too. So adding value is really important. And that's really what I look for in a commercial property deal. I think there are several benefits in investing in commercial property. The first one, if you look at it from the yield that you get, assuming that you've just got a pure commercial property, this is nothing to do with conversion now, but pure commercial property, what you'll find is the yield is probably going to be greater. So the amount that you can earn against the price that you pay will be significantly higher normally than residential. So for example, a shop might cost you £200,000 to buy, you might get £20,000 or more in rent, so you get a 10% yield. Now think about where you live and think about what you can get for rent from the residential property that's worth £200,000. So where I live, that might be something around £650, £700. So just by doing the maths, that's if it's £700, that's £8,400 a year compared to 20. So that's one big financial benefit. The other might be that you have what's called a full repairing uh, lease. What is that? Well, it means that the tenant is actually paying for the repairs or the changes to the building, not you. So it's really important because if you're a residential landlord and the boiler goes, who pays for that? You do. Whereas if it's a boiler or heating system and you've got an FRI lease in place with a commercial tenant, they pay. If there's a problem with the roof, they pay. So once again, that's one big benefit for the commercial versus the residential. Other elements come into play because if you get somebody that's in arrears with residential, it can take a long time to actually get them out and go through a legal process to get, get them evicted. Whereas if you're on commercial terms with a commercial tenant, you can use what's called CRAW, Commercial Rent Arrears Recovery. And so within about 20 days, you can have recovered your property. You can also seize the goods that are left in that property potentially to help you offset any costs or rent arrears that might be, might be there. So another benefit from having a, a commercial property. One of the biggest benefits can come from a thing called capital allowances. Capital allowances are allowance based on the building and certain elements within that building. So for example, it might be things like heating systems, switches, air conditioning. Inland revenue basically give you an allowance against those items when the property is built. However, a lot of commercial property has never ever had the capital allowances claimed for this. And it's only about 90% of properties, 90% that still have them available. So less than 10% have been claimed. So most of the time, when we're looking to buy a commercial property, we get a capital allowance. Now, what does that really mean? Sitting here in the engine shed as we are today, the capital allowances for the engine shed are over 1.2 million pounds without paying tax. That's quite a substantial saving. How do we market our properties? Well, in this particular property, the engine shed, we use Sites Cottages. Sites co Cottages are our marketing arm, if you like. So we've outsourced the marketing, getting customers into us through Sites Cottages. Now, they don't just advertise on their own website. They advertise on booking.com, uh, cottages.com, all those sort of things. So they actually do all of the marketing and drive people into the engine shed. So that's where we get our, our customers from. We haven't actually got our own website because we don't want the hassle of the day-to-day -day bookings. We want somebody else to take that on for us. We also employ, I'll call it a house manageress if you like, who comes, puts our welcome packs in and makes sure everything's up to standard as far as the cleaning's concerned. So we've pretty much outsourced pretty much everything there is to do with the running of the engine shed. As far as managing the tenants, of course, we don't have tenants here in the engine shed. We have guests. So the rights that those guests rather than tenants have are much reduced. So we have a terms and conditions when they make a booking and if they don't stick to those terms and conditions, they can be, for want of a better word, evicted, uh, taken out. But most of our bookings are short term. And what do I mean by short term? I think the shortest stay that we've had, actually we've had a one night stay for 300 pounds, but most of the stays are usually two or three nights. The average is about four nights. 
Um, so we have weekends and then weekday stays. But during the summer, I think the longest day we've had is for two weeks. So, you know, the tenants issues, we have very few tenant issues. Those are few and far between. We've also got insurance in place to cover us if they make damage, you know, they damage the, the engine shed or the, the apartment that they're stopping in. So we've got that covered. Yes, things happen, but on the whole, we've been very lucky. Uh, we had a guest come in yesterday and look round, and they actually said, well, how often uh, have you repainted? And on the whole, this has now been available for just under two years, and we've not had to wholesale redecorate yet, because the guests respect something that's decent and, uh, and provided for them. Believe it or not, I think there are two or three main ways in which I go about looking at mine. The first thing is I don't trawl right move, Zoopla and things like that because there are commercial parts of, of those uh, portals. I tend to use things like Property Link. So Property Link, I can set my searches up and I get fed in two or three emails a day, uh, whether it be potential for office to residential conversion. And so that feeds me. So that's one of the things I use quite a lot. Actually, the engine shed was on right move, having said that. Uh, and so was uh, the Carlyle or the project in Whitby. So I'm not trying to say don't use uh, Zoopla and don't use Rightmove because they, those projects are there. This project was on Rightmove probably for at least 12 months. A lot of potential developers didn't like the fact that it was grade two listed. They were worried about requirements for building regs in the listed building and they were worried how much it would cost and they couldn't see probably the potential that was sat here in the engine shed. And although it's a commercial conversion, it's really a new build inside the engine shed itself. So although commercial conversions tend to usually sound a lot cheaper on the conversion side, this is really a new build inside the shell of a stone engine shed. So what are the risks with commercial property? Good question. Well, if you don't do it correctly, you could have the wrong agreements in place. So the first thing to make sure is that the lease that you're agreeing with any tenant is the right sort of lease. If you can, then you want to try and get a fully repairing and insuring lease, as we've already talked about. That will give you, if you like, lower cost for you and put the onus on the tenant as far as any repairs are concerned. So that's really important. Also, the longer the lease that you get, there, you know, the better it is for you if you're seeking lending so fewer breaks and so there are lots of different terminologies within the commercial space that are considerably different to the residential so i'd say that one of the biggest risks is not going down the legal route uh, professionally and making sure you dot the i's and cross the t's on that i think the other risks are well i'll give you an example at the moment we're in the middle of a conversion and other things can go wrong. Well, it can go wrong with residential, but we've just had to replace our contractor. So if you replace your contractor, that can either stop your conversion or your refurbishment, uh, which means that you can't get your tenant in. So making sure you line all these things up, there are risks, but the key thing is how do you mitigate those risks? So for us, it's making sure we have enough profit in the deal in the first place that gives us a bit more wiggle room. So if you're doing a conversion, especially a commercial conversion, sometimes there are things that you can't see when you start that conversion. So, you know, there are risks there, but you have to mitigate and we mitigate by making sure we've got contingency, that we've got enough profit in there so that if we do come across issues that we've got money as a backup uh, and that our profitability is still there at the end of the day. Wow, what about that multi-million pound deal? 1.2 million pounds in capital ounces from just one deal. You can't make this stuff up. These are real property investors that have put in the time, money, effort, education, network, action, all the things that you need to do to successfully complete multi-million pound projects. And what humble guys as well. And like I said at the start, they're sharing it with you, warts and all. I have got a question for you. Would you like to learn how to do commercial property deals like Peter and Andrew did six years ago now. Because if you would, dead simple next step, click on the link below this video and do all normal stuff, you know, like, subscribe, share it with your friends and all that sort of stuff. But specifically, click on that link and register for free online training. Because I'm gonna spend time with you for free, giving you the same information that I gave to Peter and Andrew 
back in 2015. And if you like the idea of that, click that link, get yourself registered, and I will see you online. But that's it for this week on Money Matters. Really hope you enjoyed it. And you know, if, if you like this sort of content, if you actually want to see, well, never mind what you're doing, Paul, what are your students doing? So if you'd like to see more of what our students are doing, just comment below, because uh, after all, we're here to give you Money Matters that's right for you. So what kind of content do you like? What kind of style? What kind of material? And we'll see if we can fit it into the filming schedule. As always, you've been wonderful. I've been Paul, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.